Hi, uh, thanks for attending this session. I hope you enjoy it. So uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, embedded Linux security. So the idea here is to have uh, uh, an introduction on the topic. So we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what is security, uh, what why should we care about security uh, on an embedded Linux device? We are going to talk a little bit about uh, thread modeling. So we don't have much time to to go over the topic, but we're going to talk a little bit about it. And then we're going to talk about a lot of uh, mitigation techniques to improve the security on an embedded Linux device. So we have a lot of technical stuff in this in this presentation. Uh, before we start, so uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Sergio Prado. I've been working with embedded Linux development for more than 15 years. Uh, right now, I'm team lead at Toradex. Um, I I'm also have a company that do some consulting and training services. Usually or casually, I contribute to some open source software like uh, Build, Root, Yocto, and uh, the Linux kernel. And sometimes I write some uh, technical stuff on my blog, that's embeddedbits.org. So let's start with uh, an introduction to, to security, and uh, then we can talk about the technical stuff. What is security? When you when you talk about security, we really mean we want to protect something, right? We want to protect something that has some value. Uh, in an embedded device, we're talking about, for example, our code, right? We want to, for example, protect the integrity of the code. Or maybe we want to protect the data that's inside the device, right? We want to guarantee the confidentiality of the data in the device. And of course, to protect the system, we're going to have to uh, implement mitigations. We're going to have uh, costs to implement mitigations. So security really is about managing risks, right? You have to identify the risks um, on your system and mitigate these risks, right? And of course, we have some causes, and we're going to see a lot of this in this presentation. Uh, some concepts about security. So we have some, uh, we have owners, right? The owners uh, are those who benefit from the product, could be the manufacturer of the product or the final user. We have assets. Right, and that's the real reason we have security because we want to protect the asset. That could be our data, that could be our code, that could be our reputation, for example. Uh, all of these assets are assets. Uh, we have threats. Anything that uh, could act against an asset is a threat, right? And we have threat actors. There are those that want to manifest a threat in our system could be a malicious hacker or, for example, the government, right? Um, so a threat actor would uh, try to exploit a vulnerability in the system. So a vulnerability is a weakness of the system uh, via an attack vector, right? So, for example, we have a device with an Ethernet port. So the Ethernet port is our is an attack vector. A threat actor could try to exploit a vulnerability inside the device, for example, in the TCP IP stack, to have access to one of our assets inside the, the device. So this, those are some of the basic concepts of security, right? And I really like this diagram because it shows really that security is a kind of cat and mouse game, right? We have the assets, that's what, that's what we want to protect. Uh, we have vulnerabilities, right, in the assets, and we, we will always have vulnerabilities. As we're going to see in this presentation, there is no such thing as a completely safe or secure system, right? Um, the system is always uh, secure enough but you won't have a 100% secure, secure system. We have uh, threat agents that want to exploit a vulnerability in the system via an attack vector to have access to the assets. 
right? On the other side, we have the owners, could be us, that are developing the, the system or the final user. We want to prevent uh, some thread uh, agent or thread actor to exploit a vulnerability. So we will develop countermeasures or we're going to mitigate the risks of the thread uh, actor to have access or um, exploit a vulnerability to have access to our asset, right? And as I said, this is really a cat and mouse game here, right? Uh, the thread edges are, are always trying to, to exploit the system and we are always trying to uh, implement uh, mitigations to protect the system. And uh, when you think about security, uh, as one seeing in this in this presentation, uh, and as I already told, uh, we are really trying to manage or minimizing the risks of our assets to be compromised. So there is a process, there is a formal process called thread modeling that could help us to try to identify the major threat to our system so we can have a plan to mitigate it. That's the real uh, objective of a thread modeling process. The result of a thread modeling would be the thread model of your product with all of the risks identified and rank it probably because it's important to rank the, for the most important or the most impactful risk to the less. And then uh, with this thread model at hand, you would um, try to mitigate the risks and improve the security of your device. I'm going to talk a little bit here about how the thread model works, but uh, it's going to be just three, four slides that we don't have much time. We really want to talk about the technical parts of the, the security. So uh, thread model basically is represented by, by this diagram that I created. So we have the assets that we want to protect. Uh, we have threads or risks on these assets, right? And we want to mitigate this. So the thread modeling process would help you to identify all of the threads and would help you uh, to find out a way to mitigate the threads. And that's really what thread model is. There, there are a lot of uh, define it process to, to help thread model in the system. Uh, unfortunately, at least I, I don't know any thread modeling process or methodology that uh, is specific, specifically for an embedded device. So I'm going to talk here a little bit about the Microsoft methodology that's called the Stride and Thread. Just to, to have an idea of what a thread modeling methodology is. So basically here we have uh, two methodologies. We have the stride methodology. Uh, the idea here of the stride is to help us identify the thread. So basically we have a category of, thre of threads. So we have basically six, six kinds of threads. We have, for example, spoofing. Spoofing is a kind of thread where they use someone pretend, pretend to be someone who he doesn't uh, is, right? So, for example, you, you, your device has a web interface, but you don't do any authentication. So anyone could access the device uh, like being someone else. So to mitigate that kind of risk, you would implement, for example, an authentication mechanism on the web page of your device. So we have here basically six, six uh, kind of threads. This thread uh, stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, then of service and elevation of privilege. And then we would try to identify all of the threads using this, this methodology. And then we have the thread methodology where we would take in, uh, all of the threads that we have already identified and rank them. So the idea here is to have a list of the threads organized by the most uh, important thread or the thread that could cause the most impact on your system, right? So as we can see here, we have uh, five uh, rating categories how uh, much uh, put damage the thread could cause to your system. We have low, medium, or high. 
how easily it is to reproduce the, the thread, how exploitable it is, how many users would be affected by the, by the thread, and how easy it is to discover that thread. So you, you would rank all of your threads from one to three, and then in the, in the end, uh, your uh, thread would be from, as we can see, right, if all of the, the categories is one, it would be five, or if all of the categories um, is uh, three, it would be 15. So you'd have a rank of uh, threads from 15, that's the, the, the higher point here, and five. Basically, in the end of the thread modeling process, what you would have, you would have a kind of a table with all of the threads that you identified ranked and uh, mitigation for that thread, right? Of course, you could extend this table adding, for example, the cost of this mitigation because that's also important, right? Um, if the cost is too high, like it's higher than the value of the asset that you want to protect, it doesn't make sense to implement the mitigation, right? So, but that's the basic idea here of the thread modeling, to help you identify all of the threads, rank them, define mitigations, and then plan and develop and implement the mitigations to help improve the security of the, the system. So if your device has uh, requirements related to the security, it's very important to, to have a good uh, thread modeling process in place and have a good thread model of your product. So you have a plan on how to improve the security of your device. Well, for now on, we're going to basically talk about mitigations, right? So our focus here is on the technical side of the security. So we're going to talk ab about a lot of um, technical mitigations that we could use to improve the security of an embedded device. So let's start with secure boot. Uh, so you want to protect your code. Your code, it's important, you want to protect it. You want to actually protect the integrity of your code, right? You, you want to make sure that you are running the code that uh, you develop. For that, you need a secure boot process in place. You need to implement secure boot on your device. And as we're gonna see in this presentation, uh, every mitigation has some costs. In case of secure boot, of course, you're going to, you're going to have costs like uh, you're going to have to think about how you're going to manage the keys of your device. You're going to have to think about uh, the boot time because, of course, it is going to impact the boot of your device. Uh, probably could, it could make your device harder to develop if you have a secure boot, but you could work around that. Anyway you're going to have costs, of course, implementing. Uh, it's always a trade-off, right? The usability with security, with functionality. Usually we take functionality off the, off the device to improve the security, for example. How does it work? How secure boot work? Basically, uh, of course, it depends on the implementation, but usually a secure boot is implemented using digital signatures. So every component of the, the device, when you talk about an embedded Linux system, we're going to have at least the three components, right? The bootloader, the Linux kernel, and the root file system. So every component should be signed. So you sign it one component, and the component before that component is going to check the signature of the device. So the root file system is signed, and the kernel is responsible to check the signature of the root file system. The kernel is signed, and the bootloader is responsible to check the signature of the Linux kernel. So because we have one uh, component of the system checking the other component, we call this the chain of trust line. Right, so uh, one component trust in the other component. And you have something like this. So uh, this is a general example, right, 
um, we have the root file system that is signed and the kernel will have a public key. Uh, here we're talking about uh, an asymmetric public key algorithm. So the image is signed with a private key and on the device you have a public key to check the signature, right? So you don't need here to, to care about the keys. The keys are public, so there's no problem with keys. That's different uh, when you're going to talk about encryption. You're going to see that's a little bit different with the encryption. We're going to use symmetric algorithms. So in that case, we, we need to care about where to store the, the keys. But we don't have the, this problem here. So the root file system signed it. The kernel is going to check the signature because the kernel is signed. We have the, the public key uh, that uh, is, uh, it was used. Uh, it, to sign ex actually the, 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 the image is signed with a private key and the public key is going to check the signature. Uh, of course, we're going to see here uh, the, the key is not inside the kernel, but it's going to be in the in a hard disk that's going to, to check the root file system. And then we have the bootloader with a public key correspondent to the private key that was used to sign the kernel. And uh, the first component is very important because uh, we have to trust uh, in, in someone, right? So the first component we, we call the root of trust. So in this case, it's the code inside the SOC that we usually call the wrong code. Um, and of course, as we can see, we need support in the hardware to implement a uh, secure boot. If our SOC doesn't have this support, we can't basically implement because everything starts inside the, the SOC, right? If the SOC can't check the, the authenticity of the code that, he, that he's going to load to his internal memory, you can't implement a secure boot process. Uh, in the first next in the next two slides, I'm talking about how it is implemented on IMX6 how we could implement it on the SOC line from NXP, call it IMX6. Instead of showing these two slides, I'm going to show the diagram that I created. Uh, basically, it's, it's what I already explained in the other diagram, but here is more detailed, right? So everything starts inside the SOC. On, in the case of the IMX6, we have a piece of hardware called HUB, High Assurance Boot. Uh, and then this is the secure boot implementation from I, uh, NXP. Then we, we're going to have to store inside SOC the public keys. Actually, we don't uh, store inside the, the, the SOC the public keys. We just is, um, store the, the, the hash of the public key. And then uh, when the, the, the bootloader inside SOC, right, the wrong code, load the bootloader to memory, it's going to ask to load the certificate and the signature. And inside the certificate, we're going to have the public key. So he's going to take the public key, calculate the hash, match with the hash that he has inside the, the SOC, then to validate the, the public key. With that public key, he's going to check the signature of the bootloader. And the bootloader is going to have the public key of the Linux kernel. Um, we usually, uh, when we implement a secure boot on Linux, we usually use the, an, an image format called the Fitch image. Uh, so the Fitch image is, is an image format. With, basically, it's a container of images uh, with hashes and signatures. So we can add any kind of image with any kind of signature. And the U-boot is capable of uh, like opening the fit image and uh, extracting the images inside this container image and check the signature of each image. So we have inside this fit image, we have the Linux kernel itself. We have device trees, possibly, if we're talking about ARM. And we're going to have our hand disk, a hand disk image that's going to boot to check the root file system. So uh, each of these images is going to be signed uh, with a private key and the uh, U-boot is going to have the public key to check the signatures. And the next step, 
when the kernel boots the run disk, the init from the run disk, and the run disk is going to be responsible to check the signature of the root file system. For that, we have some options. Uh, it depends on if you are uh, using a read-only root file system or a read-write root file system. In the case of a read-only root file system, uh, the option that we have to validate the integrity of the root file system is using a device mapper module in the kernel called DM varied. That's, for example, the way that Android works. And uh, if we are using a root uh, read-write root file system, we have two other options, at least that I know, uh, that it's called they are called IMA and uh, DM very DM integrity. Uh, let's give here an example using the DM uh, verity. So basically, the root file system is here. is It is read-only. Basically, at uh, build time, uh, we, we're going to use the valid setup tool that's going to hash all of the blocks of the root file system. It's going to create a hash uh, of each block. And then after that, it's going to take every two blocks and create another hash. After that, take another two blocks, create another hash, and it's going to build a hash tree. And of course, uh, in the end, we're going to have one hash that represents all of the root file system. And this hash is signed, and the hand disk is going to check the signature. And during execution, if you change one bit in the root file system, the, sh the, the, the hash won't match, won't match, and then uh, the file system access won't work, right? So it really guarantees the integrity of the, the root file system. That's, uh, of course, you, we, we could have, and we have uh, a whole presentation on secure boot, so we don't have much time to go deeper in this topic. Oops, nothing is 100% secure, of course. So if your root of trust is compromised, all of our systems are compromised, right? And that, that's what happened almost three years ago when uh, vulnerabilities were found inside the high assurance boot of the IMX devices from NXP. Uh, these are the links. If you are interested in this, have a look. Basically, you could craft uh, a specific certificate that would basically crash the, the home code of the IMX and would bypass the secure boot process. These vulnerabilities were fixed with new uh, silicon, but of course, if you are using silicon manufacturer before these dates, you could really be using um, vulnerable devices, at least in respect to secure boot. Well, secure boot is good to prevent, uh, to guarantee the integrity of your code, but you would prevent anyone from heavy access of your code, right? If you want, for example, to protect the intellectual property of your code, or uh, and that's more common, right? If you want to protect the data of your device, you will need to use encryption. Uh, I would say it's not common to encrypt applications on Linux. You could, for example, encrypt your applications, but for example, encrypt the root file system. It's not very common for some reasons. Uh, for example, you are using a lot of open source code, so it doesn't make sense to encrypt uh, open source code, right? Uh, because the cost is higher. Uh, and doesn't make much sense. The other problem is GPL v3, right? Because with GPL v3, you have to provide some kind of access to to the user to update the software on the device. And if you implement some kind of encryption, you won't make this possible for the user. So I would say that's not very common to encrypt code in, in Linux, in better Linux devices, but uh, it could be, uh, uh, requirement uh, related to the data, right? And what we have to work with encryption on Linux. Basically, we could use two approaches. We could do a full disk encryption or we could use a file-based uh, encryption. With full disk encryption, uh, we basically have a device mapper module called called DMCrypt. Basically, this module stands uh, on top of the block device. So every, block, every access to the block device would uh, go to the dmcrypt module that will do at runtime encryption and decryption of the, the block device. 
And uh, if you if you want to do uh, encryption on the file system, on top of the file system, uh, we have two options: F FS Script. That's basically an API provided by some file systems like XT4 or UBFS. Another option is EcryptFS. That's a layer that you could uh, add on top of any file system. So could be other file system, for example, HT3. It could be um, I don't know any other flash file system. So it's really a generic uh, implementation that you could use on top of any kind of file system on Linux. Just to to make a clear an example, so imagine a system when you have where you have a secure boot and with encryption. What would change? In the end of the boot, uh, the root file system would uh, mount. So in this example here, we have a dedicated partition with the data of the device, right? And the data is encrypted. So uh, uh, a script would run in the initialization to uh, mount this encrypted device. In this example, I'm using the EcryptFS. So could be on top of any file system, right? And then we would have a secure boot system guaranteeing the integrity of the, the application with encryption to guarantee the confidentiality of the data. Here we have one problem, right? Because when you talk about encryption, we talk about a symmetric key. And then uh, the problem is where we would store these keys. This is a very good book. Uh, if you are interested in hardware hacking, I would suggest you to read this book, Hacking the Xbox. Uh, the link is there. It's uh, the book's public. You can download it. It's a very good book uh, written by Andrew uh, Bunny Hank. Uh, he was he. He was the first that hacked the, the first generation of the Xbox. So this is the picture of uh, a small device that he developed. He just uh, connected this device between the, the CPU and memory buses. So he could just sniff all of the communication between the CPU and the memory. And then uh, he created a, a special software basically to look for the key inside the the data that the, he collected with this uh, small board. And he could find it. So uh, basically, the Xbox had the keys inside the, the flash memory. And the keys during boot was just uh, read from memory. It was laying there uh, in clear text. Uh, and he was able, after he find the key, he was able to uh, encrypt any application, run any application in the Xbox. So, yeah, the, the message here is uh, if you work with encryption, you must protect your key. Your key don't uh, need to be, or your key need to be protected from the rest of the system, right? And, yeah, you're going to need harder for that. So, uh, you're going to he need help from, the, from a harder device to protect the key. Actually, there are some alternatives, like, like uh, if you are developing a device that has some interaction with the user, you could derive the key from a password of the user, right? That's, for example, how Android works. So in that case, the key would be encrypted uh, with an algorithm. Uh, that could be uh, using the password of the user. But uh, usually an embedded device don't, doesn't have this interaction, right? You, you don't interact with the device. So, yeah, you, you're going to have to think about a good way to restore the key uh, that you're going to use to do encryption. We're gonna, we have some options here. Uh, for example, you, if you are lucky and your SOC has some uh, cryptographic modules uh, 
the solution is there. For example, on IMX devices, again from INXP, from NXP, uh, there is a cryptographic module called CAN. Uh, this uh, piece of hardware inside the SOC has a kind of master key that's unique per device. So you could use this master key to cryptograph to cryptograph your key and store your key uh, encrypted in your root file system, for example. So this this could be an option, right? But if you are not using uh, an SOC that has this kind of capabilities, what you could do? Uh, you could use uh, an external device, for example, a secure element or a TPM device. Both are devices that provide uh, cryptographic functions and uh, secure storage for you. A third option would be a trusted execution environment. I'm going to talk a little bit later about it. So a secure element is basically a secure device, a secure computing device with uh, code running inside of it and providing you secure storage. A good example of a secure element is uh, smart cards. You could use a smart card on a bad Linux device, but I would say it's not that common compared to a TPM device. A TPM device, actually a TPM is not a device, a TPM is a specification. Is an ISO standard and specifies uh, cryptographic functions uh, and uh, devices implemented this this specification. Uh, the TPM device usually has a I square C or SPI connection, so that's why it's more common on uh, embedded Linux device. Well, not, none of this matters if your code is buggy, if your code has uh, vulnerabilities, right? Because, yeah, of course, you could uh, implement secure boot, you could encrypt your device, but if your code is buggy, the thread actor will find the vulnerability and will exploit your device. So it's very important to think about the quality of your code you are developing, and of course, the, the code that you are using on your device. So, uh, code with security in mind is very important if the security is a uh, requirement for you. This is just an example, and we have hundreds of examples of uh, vulnerability. So, this vulnerability is from the Linux kernel. It was there for several years and if you're running a device that uh, has a kernel from 2.6 to 5.2, you're vulnerable if you are using the virtual uh, subsystem of the Linux kernel. Uh, yeah, that's why we need to care a lot about security, because uh, if our device is vulnerable, it could be exploited, right? So what kind of indications do we have for, uh, to protect our code. First, use the static analysis tools. So this is, this, is, this is kind of tools that could improve the quality of our code, uh, finding uh, problems like buffer overflows and things like that. Uh, we have uh, very good uh, open source tools like CPP Check and Clank. Clank has a, a very good uh, static analysis uh, tool inside of it. We have also uh, some commercial tools, but yeah, if you're developing code in C, C++, in, in uh, softwares that uh, using languages that are not memory safe, like C, C++, you have to use, we have to, to have some kind of uh, static code analysis uh, in your system. You could also enable runtime protections, right? So this is kind of protections that uh, are run, as, as the, the name implies, right, uh, at runtime. So, uh, for example, Valgrind is a very known tool uh, that is capable of checking memory access and identifying, for example, memory leaks. Uh, Another uh, protection that is very common if, uh, and you have to enable if uh, you have security in mind is ASLR, address space layout randomization. So imagine, for example, that your kernel is crashing. 
uh, when your kernel crashes, you have the dump, right? The kernel ops message with a lot of uh, memory addresses and things like that. That's that's what the, the attacker wants because there you have the addresses of the functions and it's very easy for the attacker to develop an exploit uh, using this information. But if you enable the ASRR in the Linux kernel, uh, it would randomize the addresses during boot, so every boot is going to have another address, so it would make very difficult for the attacker to develop an exploit. Of course, it's not possible, but it would make, make it more harder for the attacker. Another uh, tool that you could use to improve the security of your software is uh, fuzzing. Fuzzing is a kind of technique that uh, you could use to basically automate tests, right? So this tool is capable of uh, generate uh, inputs to your software. So imagine you have a software that uh, collects data from the from a network interface. So a fuzzy tool would send uh, data to the network interface to try to crash your application, to find bugs, find that kind of corn case of an application that uh, you difficult test, you, you don't uh, usually test it, right? Uh, there are some very good uh, fuzzing tools. For example, this is color is a tool that's used to to fuzz the Linux kernel, and it has already found hundreds of bugs in the Linux kernel. Well, uh, you could protect uh, uh, your application, but you will always have bugs. Um, software always have bugs, right? And, they say they say basically for every thousand line of, lines of code you have one bug. So yeah, you have you're gonna have bugs. Uh, and how do you mitigate that? Even with uh, trying to minimize Thing you could do use Linux capabilities. So the idea of the Linux capabilities is to to uh, basically uh, help you drop the privileges of a root user. So your application would just enable the capabilities needs and then drop the the rest of the capabilities. So if an attacker exploit your software, you would want to have the capabilities that you enable. So for example, there are some implementations of the ping command that has only the cap natural capability enabled, right? So uh, although it runs uh, as the root user, it doesn't have all root access, right? And that's good in terms of security. But the capabilities is not that flexible. If you want uh, an access control that's more flexible, then you're gonna probably uh, have to use a mandatory access control and a secure model from the, from the Linux kernel. So we usually, from Unix system, we, we usually uh, uh, use it to, to work with uh, DAC, discretionary access control uh, that uh, access control flags like read, write, execute from user group other, right? But this is not that flexible. For example, you want to prevent an application from access all TCP ports but port 80. You can't do that with uh, DAC, discretionary access control, but you can do that with a Mac a mandatory access control. Basically, in a Mac system, you have uh, objects and subjects. Uh, object is everything in the system, like a file, a socket, and a subject 
is uh, basically process. So you would define what a subject can do with an object. There are some uh, Mac implementations in Linux using the Linux security model. Uh, I would say the two most uh, famous uh, are SC Linux and Appy Armor. For example, Android uses SC Linux, Appy Armor is used in Ubuntu. Yeah, and uh, another layer that you could add, add to your application is sandboxing the application. So the idea here is to run your application isolated from the rest of the system. Uh, there are some uh, approaches for that. We could use virtualization, but virtualization is not, uh, is very costly for an embedded device. I would say nowadays we, we could use on an embedded Linux system containers and T trusted execution environments, right? So a container is basically a minimal file system with the application and all it needs to run. And a container with some help from the kernel would run isolated from the rest of the system. So if you compromise a software that is running inside a container, uh, only the container is compromised, not the rest of the system. That's the idea, right, of, of containers. Um, it's not that containers is secure by default, right? But you could use this tool, run your application inside a container to improve the security of your system. Another approach uh, to uh, sandbox your application is using a trusted execution environment. I won't go over much of this topic, uh, but uh, the idea here uh, is that with a container, you can protect your applications, but you can't protect the kernel. So if the kernel is compromised, the system is compromised, right? With a trusted execution environment, the, if the kernel is compromised, you can still protect the system, protect your asset, because your asset would be protected by the trusted execution environment. That's basically the, the idea. Let me show here this diagram. So you would basically have another operating system running uh, side by side with your operating system, that would be Linux, right? And uh, what you want to trust, you would put in the trusted execution environment. Of course, you need hardware support for that. So some of you ha may have heard of uh, Trust Zone, right? Trust Zone is a piece of hardware inside the ARM, inside the ARM processors that help you implement this kind of uh, segmentation of the system. And it's very common today, right? The uh, T implementations, like we have T inside our smartphones, inside TVs, inside set top boxes. Well, uh, just a uh, couple of more slides. Uh, all of this is important, right? But you have to have an update system because Bugs exist, you're going to have to fix the bugs, uh, you're going to have to update your device, and then you need a, we need an update system for that. If your device has security in mind, you need, you really need to have an update system. Could be OTA, of course, that would be good to be OTA over the air because you could update anytime you want if your device is connected. Uh, could be offline also, but it's important to update your device because bugs will happen, uh, and especially security bugs. And to protect against security bugs, you have to update your, your device. There are some challenges to, to uh, implement an update system. Um, and of course, we could have a whole application on that. We, we think we have to think about security integrity if it is atomic or not uh, the bandwidth that it uses speed if you have rollback capabilities and things like that we have some strategies to update the system what is important here is to have an update system a good update system an update system that is basically able to to not uh, break the device right that's atomic that's that's really really important 
And of course, if you are implementing an operating system uh, with some connectivity, you have a network connect. Uh, we have you have network connectivity. You're, you're going to have to think about the security of your network device. And uh, yeah, uh, networks are a whole other topic. I won't go much over it, but it's very important to think about it. Uh, one really important thing here is that. You have to uh, basically decrease the attack surface, right? So disable everything you don't need. Disable every protocol. Close all the ports that you don't need. Uh, if uh, network security is very important, uh, enable an EDS system to detect intrusion. Create fire rules to prevent, for example, denial of service attacks. All of this is important to a secure connected uh, device. Yeah, and uh, I would say here that there, there is no uh, one solution that fits all, right? If, you, if we think about security, as we can say, see here, we have layer on top of layer on top of layer on top of layer, right? Uh, we need to protect our code, so let's protect the integrity, let's use secure boot, but the code could, be, could have bugs, let's use stat analysis tools, Let's check uh, the the software during runtime. Let's use uh, mandatory access control. Let's run inside a container. So, uh, if an attacker could pass one layer, is going to block in the other. That's the idea, right? Make it more difficult to the attacker to have access to your assets. And I think that's what this image brings to us. Yeah, so let's close here the presentation. Uh, some general rules about security. Uh, so we really need to think about the defense in depth, right? Layer on top of layer of security. Uh, security involves all of the levels of the system. So if you only think about the security of the device, what about the security of the cloud system that the device is connected on? You have to think about it also. Uh, always use the least privileged principle. Don't uh, use obscurity or obfuscation. Don't invent our own uh, algorithms. Don't do that. Uh, and of course, as I said before, there is no 100% uh, secure code. You will have some kind of issue. So uh, we, we try just to minimize right, the risks uh, of your assets to be compromised. So if your device uh, has some kind of security uh, requirement, think about it, design with security in mind, create a thread model to identify the assets, threads, attack vectors, and mitigate risks, right? Always follow good practice, don't invent anything, always use what is there, known techniques, known tools, and have a good update system. Uh, if you can't, monitor uh, software vulnerabilities and patch the system and update the system. So, yeah, this presentation, the idea, the idea was to have an introduction on the topic, right? So, basically, we saw here the main techniques to, to improve uh, security of uh, an embedded Linux device. I I hope you enjoyed this presentation. You have you have here my uh, contact, so feel free to send me an email. Feel free to to get in touch with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And uh, again, I really hope you enjoyed this presentation. Let me know if you have any feedback. And now uh, we're going to the question and answer session. So thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. This is me now live here. Uh, thanks for attending this talk. I hope you really enjoyed. Uh, I tried to answer most of the questions uh, during the presentation. We don't have much time now. It's less than a minute right now. Uh, I'm sorry about the glitches during the presentation. I didn't know that uh, when we recorded, didn't get any feedback on the recording. So I would record again, but I didn't know we had, we had some glitches during the recording session. So, so sorry about that. 
you can find the slides on sketch.com I just uploaded today so if you don't find feel free to write me uh, this is my uh, email Twitter LinkedIn feel free to connect with me and uh, I'm gonna be a while in the Slack channel in the bad Linux Slack channel so feel free to go there and ask me questions there so again thanks a lot for attending this session and stay safe bye bye